Let's stand for the reading of God's holy word. Onward, Christian soldiers, discipleship class. I believe that this is 196, is that correct? 196. Yeah, I think that's what it's saying, but I think it's 196. I think it's 196, but uh, whatever the case, we're going to deal with the subject once again, how to overcome temptation, part 71. This is a big series because this is a big problem. The Bible reads in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses, verse 13, our passage for the entire series, but we're expanding it to other passages as we are today. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Stop thinking you're the only one facing this temptation. You're not. Even though we do have people who will lie and say that they are not tempted. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. lesson today is titled How to Overcome Temptation, Part 71. In this section of our own Christian Soldiers Discipleship class, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are looking at specific temptations that are, as the Bible says, common to man. We are looking at what the Bible says about these temptations and these sins so we can be aware of its dangers and so that we can hide Holy Scripture in our hearts to use when we are tempted. The sin that we are going to begin looking at today is the sin of sloth, the sin of laziness. This is the fourth sin in a list of 12 temptations or sins that comes from two sources, one ancient and one modern. The first source is a list that was developed by monks in the early church called the seven deadly sins or the cardinal sins. The second source is a Bonner survey from 2011, which tracked the top temptations Americans admitted to struggling with. And so today we will start once again by looking at Genesis 2.15. Remember the text of this lesson is made available online after each class, so you can go to our website at Gospel Light House of Prayer International uh, dot com and click the Onward Christian Soldiers banner on the home page and begin to learn these verses by heart throughout the week. So turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter two, verse fifteen. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden 
to dress it and to keep it, in other words, to work. Holy Father God, someone has said that working hard always produces good results, but working at what you love uh, is almost like not working. Whatever the case, Holy Father God, help us to be men and women, boys and girls, who understand that you put us here to work, not just to sit down on our cans and do nothing, and do the least, and be slothful, and be lazy, and be drowsy. Have mercy and grace, Lord, upon us, and forgive us of our sins, of not only lust and temptation, uh, Forgive us of our sins of not only lust uh, and yielding to the temptation to lust, but forgive us of our sins of slothfulness and laziness and drowsiness. And help us to confess our sins unto you and to repent and to turn away from our sin of slothfulness and laziness. Fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit and help us to be energetic and hardworking in the right things. For your glory, your praise, and honor. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, Benjamin Franklin said, leisure is the time for doing something useful. This leisure, the diligent person will obtain. The lazy one, never. That is so true. Beloved, in our last lesson on this subject, we introduced the topic of God's intention that man be engaged in useful, productive work. Ask yourself, are you engaged in useful, meaningful, productive work that not only advances you, speaker, that not only advances you, but advances other people, that helps other people, that serves other people, that glorifies God, that makes uh, the things that he has created, the raw material, into what is useful for the benefit of mankind. Although the Garden of Eden was a perfect environment for man, God commanded Adam to dress it and to keep it. God wants you to dress and keep as well meaning taking the raw materials that God has provided and becoming innovative and doing something with it to glorify God's name and to uh, make it flourish. And nobody does this like the state of Israel. Israel is the most hated state in the world. The Jews are the most hated people in the world, but everybody in the world calls on Israel 
for expertise in many, many areas. The two biggest areas that the whole world calls on Israel for is number one, and they have very, very limited resources. Number one is security. Protection from terrorists. That's number one. Every country in the world wants to know from Israel how to do it. Number two, which is going to become increasingly more valuable, is water. Israel is, uh, does not have all the water they need. And so Israel leads the world in recycling water, wastewater. Uh, in a very powerful and beautiful way. And uh, the world is calling on them on how to do that because, as you know, wars can begin over water. Make no mistake about it. And that's just the top two. But IT will probably be third. Now the car industry The Jews are hard workers. They're innovative. Now the car industry from all over the world is calling on Israel because in the words of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, all cars are now and in the future will be nothing but computers on wheels. And through hard work and the giftedness from God, Israel has cornered the market on that. Ford, Chrysler, Chevrolet, Mercedes, VW, Jaguar, everybody's calling on Israel now because Israel has worked hard and they have cornered the market on the idea that cars from this point forward will be nothing but computers on wheels. So nobody has done it like the people of God, the chosen people of God, Israel. Enemies are calling on Israel. Arab nations are secretly calling on Israel. Show us how to protect ourselves. Because they're hard workers. While everybody else is sleeping, they're staying up working hard. They understand the principle of industry. Amen, somebody. And they're flat getting it done. And you can get it done if you work hard, whether you are white black or red or yellow. If you work hard, pray hard, think hard, even play hard for the short time you have to play. But we Americans, we have flipped the whole script. We play hard and we don't work hard. We write books on the four day week not the six day week, but the four day week. And then we have the audacity to write, the, write a book on the one day week, just work one day and, and play the rest of the days. Now you're not getting, you're not gonna get anywhere doing that. So beloved, last week we looked at the meaning of the word dress, to labor, to do work, or to serve, if you will, to uh, make it even more productive, more fruitful. The term keep comes from the Hebrew word Shema, and it means to God, to preserve, 
to protect. Dress and keep. Watch and pray. This word introduces the stewardship of man over the earth. The stewardship, I said the stewardship of man over the earth. Adam was not only to work in the garden, but it was his job to preserve the garden as God had given it to him. Not just to lay down on his uh, beach chair and soak up the sun and watch the garden grow wild. He was to keep it in the condition in which he had received it. And that, of course, required diligent work. God has given, and let me say something here that is going to offend some people. And I'm, I'm going to say it as nice as I can. One thing I like about a certain group of people, I don't care what kind of house they have, it looks pristine and great all of the time. I'm talking about the yard. They work hard to keep their yards up. And then you go right down the street in the same community, same city. Listen to me carefully, and, and everybody in here knows what I'm talking about. You, you would never say it like this, and I'm not saying it as hard as I can say it. And they have houses too. God has given them a house, and there's trash on the property. Trash in the ditch. Grass is not cut. Bushes are not trimmed. What's going on? they're not keeping and they're not dressing. Amen, somebody. And it does not matter what kind of house you give them. See, it's the character of the people. And some of you don't like it. You know where I'm going with this. You cannot stand it, but you know it's true. Let me say it this way. Some of us Negroes don't want some other Negroes to move into our pristine neighborhoods because they the, the yard is going to turn into a garage and, and, and the grass is not going to be cut. Weeds are going to be growing and uh, trash is going to be on the yard and, and our property values will go down. Now, let me say it that way. To put a little bit more bite because we, for some reason, uh, thank God for people who appreciate what they have and uh, they, uh, by the grace of God, have the character uh, to keep it clean, not just for others, but for themselves. Amen, ceiling, amen, walls, amen, lights up in here. God help us from the lazy butts. Excuse me. God help us and deliver us from lazy, slothful people who won't put, pick up the paper in their own yard. Dump stuff in their own yard. Won't cut the grass. Unless guests are coming over. God wants you to appreciate what he gives you to dress and keep. For his glory. And because you know it's right to do. And that you like for things to be neat and clean. It is a shame before... God, when the house gets so nasty, the 
room gets so nasty that the baby child got to uh, uh, tell the mother, please clean up this room. Or ask the father to make the mother clean up this room. How many of you know people that no, no, it doesn't matter what time you go over to the house, that house is spick and span clean. They, you don't have to wait at the door before she pushes everything under the rug and cleans the, the snot and the baby diaper off the couch. But how many do you know, no matter what time of the day it is, you got to wait 10 minutes at the door uh, before the wife is, opens the door for you to come in. Because quite frankly, she's a slob. Always got a nightgown on that has spit up and everything on it. House looks worse. There are just some people who, who like to live in a clean house and a clean yard, and there are some people who evidently like to live in a nasty house, in a nasty yard. Now, there's a, that's a problem. God has blessed both with a place to dress and keep, uh, and one does it and the other does not. The other one is lazy, slothful, slow-moving. you don't like that but that's true it's true certain people move into the neighborhood and you, you, you say oh boy here we go within a week a trash bag is sitting out in the front yard for no apparent reason car drives by. Evidently the bag was not even tied up. And then some of the trash flows out into the street. Blows over into your yard. Now you're ready to fight. Now you want to. In the words of my dad, lay hands on somebody. Contrary to the perspective of most people today, beloved, work was not originally something negative or hard, or to be seen as hard, even though work can be hard. Work was, for lack of a better term, something pleasant, something good. There's nothing wrong with work. Work was fun, and e even even in this day and time, not like it was in its original state. But uh, you've heard the statement that if you do what you love, it's not even considered work. If you love food and you love working around food and you love cooking food. That's not work, even though it is work, and you will work to, and you you will work so hard you will sweat. Sweat will come off of your brow. In a very real sense, but if you love it, it's it's almost like it's not even work. That's somewhat like it was in the original state. Work was not stressful for Adam. Not this work that God gave him. It was fun. But work was still work. Because, and by the way, it is not work unless it is productive. Can somebody say amen? May God deliver us from these people who say they went to work, but they, they never, they, they're, they're working, but they're not producing anything. There's no result. Are you kidding me? 
if you work hard in a garden and you plant something after a while, by and by, something ought to come up. And these, these sick people who have in their mind, they, they, they say that they're working, but there's no production. Are you kidding me? I guess there's something called being employed and then gainfully employed, where there's a result that comes out of your labor. Some fruit. Somewhere, somehow, some way. The nature of work changed only when Adam and Eve sinned against God. God judged Adam for his sin, stating, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. You didn't listen to me, Adam, and boy, this has been the story since that time. More men have gotten their behinds in trouble with God by listening to their wives and not listening to God. Then a little bit. God blessed Abraham because he knew that Abraham would command his family to follow him. God can't bless most men today because they can't even command themselves, much less their wife and children, to do anything. Or to accomplish anything for the glory of God. And we got some men today so vagina whipped that they uh, can't do anything without getting permission from their wives. It's disgusting. And I'm talking about in the church. You say, I, I preach, I just can't believe you said I said it. And I meant it. I'm not crazy. My boys and I were in a uh, place uh, just last night uh, doing some internet work. And we were the only ones there. And then the man walked in, and just he walked in talking. I said, What in the world? And uh, he sat down. They served him some food. I don't even think he went up to the counter. They ordered the food. They just, the people being nice to him and uh, served him some food. He talked the whole time. You say, was anybody with him? No, that's the problem. He was talking to himself out loud and we, they, he did, did, totally oblivious to us sitting right there. And uh, somehow this particular place had a television, and he talked back to the television. There you go. There you go. Mm, here we go. Here we go. You see, was the television on? Where you could hear it? No. But he was responding to something. Uh, what am I saying? I assure you, I am not crazy. I am. I, I know exactly what I'm saying. That's how many men are today. They are vagina whipped. To the point they can't do anything without getting the okay from their wife. Hearkening to the voice of their wife. Over hearkening to the voice of God. And pastors do not realize it. They have encouraged it. They have pushed it. Listen to your wife now, gentlemen, men. Listen to your wife. God will speak through your wife to you. Have you lost your mind? No man in his right mind believes that. Because God is the author of order. God is the creator of a chain of command. Why would God bypass the wife, bypass the husband, and speak to the wife his truth so that the wife can tell him during a pillow talk session? And, and, and by violating the word of God, pastors do not understand that they are undermining their ministry. And some are starting to see it. Because as soon as that wife gets upset over anything like the color of the drapes, she'll pull her whole family of nine out of that church. Don't tell me it's not happening. It has happened and it is happening.
hearkening to the voice of his wife. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Amen, somebody. This curse does not give us an excuse to loathe the work. Instead, as saved people, as God's people, we recognize that Jesus has removed the curse for us. We no longer walk under the curse of sin, so we do not have to maintain a negative perspective about work. And most Christians I know, truly born again ones, don't see work the way the world does. The world talks about how you doing? Well, you know, it's Blue Monday. How you doing? I'm making it on Tuesday. How you doing today? Well, you know, Wednesday. It's hump day now. It's hump day. We're almost there. How you feeling on Thursday? Well, a little bit better. How you doing today on Friday? Thank God it's Friday. They don't mention God on the other, the other days. And they're saying it for the wrong reason. They're saying it because they hate their job and they're getting ready to get off for two days. The Christian does not look at work that way. Oh, we shouldn't look at work that way. We have a different attitude. Uh, Sunday is beautiful. Monday is beautiful. Tuesday is beautiful. Wednesday is beautiful. Thursday is beautiful. Friday is beautiful. Doesn't mean that it's, not, it's easy, but we thank God for every day. Amen, somebody. Somebody walked by uh, a supervisor one day, and evidently the supervisor must have been a, a believer. Says it's a good day today, isn't it, sir? It's a good day. The supervisor says it's a good day every day. <laughs> it's a good day every day. Every day you are alive, it's a good day. And you can enjoy any kind of work. In fact, let me tell you something. A man who does not, listen to me very carefully, a man who does not work is a miserable man. I'm here to tell you. Work is good for man. And work is good for woman. Yeah, even if she's in the home, which if she does it right, it is the most important work in the world. And some of your wives are miserable because you, sir, don't put her to work. I'm going to shock and amaze you and tell you something that you don't know about your wife. You think your wife uh, is going to be happy by you buying her every little diamond ring, every little diamond bracelet, every little necklace, every pearl, and giving her a credit card to spend up and, and, and almost take you to great paying for it at the mall. Buy her a new car every year. That's going to, listen to me very carefully. That has never made a woman happy. That has never made a woman joyful and at peace and content. In most cases, it has made a woman like that worse. Now, a woman who has done her job as a wife and a mother, check that, make sure that's the same. She deserves all that and more because her, her prices fall by rule. But, but let her raise those children first. Let her keep your house clean for some years. Put her to work. Make her productive. And you'll have a happier wife. You know why? I'm getting ready to shock and amaze you. 
I'm getting ready to blow your little mind, sir, because you don't know what makes your wife tick. You don't know what make women tick. Women want to be used. They want to help. They are wired beyond, listen, listen to me very carefully. Beyond all of that fussing and bickering and, and snapping the sh uh, being snappy and, and uh, having a bad attitude and talking back to you, all that. That's, uh, get past all that. And let your wife know that you expect certain things from her. She needs to do this, this, and this. Whatever is your attitude. Whatever. But I want this done. And if she knows that you mean business, now some of you old folks, you probably can't do this now. So don't even try it. But I'm talking to you younger men who are establishing your home. Your wife wants to be used. And if you don't use her, somebody else will. Your wife is wired to help. Your wife is wired to be a blessing. God made her that way. Now the curse has messed her up. But women want to deep down, they want to contribute. They want to help. They want to help their husband first. They want to help their children second. And then they want to help out in the community through the church if they're Christians. Now, yes, you got some women who have rebelled against that idea and some women who will buck at it. But if you are a man's man, and she knows it. She might fuss, she might buck, she might kick, but she'll do it. My wife has been the happiest when I tell her these dishes need to be washed and now. And she might bristle, but once she gets to going, she's a much more contented and happier person. You say, preacher, how do you know that to be true for all women? I know that to be true because God has wired women to be a help me from the jump, from the get-go. Stop putting your children to work and you, you're going to work and you never put your wife to work. She wants to be useful deep down. She wants to know that she's contributing to your success. She wants to be productive. Everybody in their right mind, even if they're slothful as hell and lazy as hell, they want to be productive. They want to work. They want to do something. And even men may buck and kick and may not want to get out of the bed and go to work, but there's something about getting up, washing your face, putting your work clothes on, and getting out, uh, getting out of that house is the key. Once you get that car jacked up and ready to go and you back out of that garage and you head on down the road and you see the sun coming up and you get your first cup of coffee, oh man, there's nothing like it for a man. And then you hit that job and you start working. You overcome inertia. It's a beautiful thing. You get a sense of, uh, of uh, being productive. You get a sense of uh, being gainfully employed. Uh, you, you, you get a feeling of responsibility that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing as a man. The same thing for a woman. And by the way, the same thing for children. I was a rebellious teenager, but I worked my butt off and uh, uh, I felt very proud, a little man that I was, I felt very proud that I could slap $20 in my mother's hand and say, Mom, you know, do something with that. And she probably looked at, looked at the $20 and turned around uh, in the room after I left the room and laughed, but I, I, was, uh, I was happy that I could contribute. And I was a rebellious child. I was happy that I could go down to the 10 cent store. Some of y'all don't 
know anything about that. All you know about is the dollar store, uh, the uh, five dollar store now below five or five below. <laughs> we had the we had the we had the ten cent store. Pleather was in back in those days. Pleather. It's fake leather. Plastic. And I remember I went into the nickel and dime store, what we called it, downtown. And I bought my first wallet because I had my first job. I thought I was somebody. I, I was no I, I couldn't have been no more than 15, 16 years old. But see my mother Timmy, my grandmother Timmy, she made us work. She she taught us uh, as the old grandmothers used to teach uh, that uh, in the words of Billy Preston nothing from nothing leaves nothing you got to have something if you're going to be with me my grandmother Tempe she knew we weren't worth a flip cutting the grass but she made us cut the grass and she always paid us our money in a handkerchief to this day I don't know why my mother Tempe always put her money in a handkerchief. Even if she, she didn't go to church on a Sunday morning, she said, Danny boy, take my dues. Back then, you didn't pay no tithes and offering. You paid your dues. There was another more than a dollar or two. Take my dues up to Mount Shiloh Baptist Church. She paid us to cut grass. She paid us to do certain things. And I remember as a little boy, going into the nickel and dime store. I was so proud of myself. I could have been no more than 14, 15 years old, and I bought my first, I remember the color of a brown wallet. It was pleather. Man, I thought I was a big man. I thought I was somebody. I put my money in that wallet. I didn't have any ID or anything like that. Uh, I pulled that wallet out. When I got home and pulled out some money and gave it to my mom, I said, Mom, do something with that. Straight face. I was just as serious as I could be. I thought I was a big man. A big somebody. For some reason, some of that is gone today. I thank God for my oldest daughters. Uh, got jobs. And buddy, they, they uh, still tithe and give to this ministry. And... Uh, I mean, they're faithful, and they, they do it for the glory of God. I never asked them to do it, but they still support the ministry here. They do it on their own, and done a whole lot of other things on their own. And so, ladies and gentlemen, our work is good. One movie character said, greed is good. No, it's not, but work is good. Labor is good. Working hard and getting something done, getting something done, getting a job done is good for your psychology, for your mind, for your heart. And I have shared so much with you already today, and uh, I have so much more to share with you on this subject. So at this time, I'm going to close it. Uh, I'm cutting it off before we even get to the middle. But you have gotten the message. You need to work. You need to pray hard. You need to think hard. You need to work hard. And you need to play hard. So, beloved, in closing, uh, let's pray. And then I want to share something with those who don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. Holy Father God, we praise you and we thank you for this Bible lesson today. We praise you and we thank you for your Holy Word as we deal with the subject of slothfulness and laziness and the value of hard work. For Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us of our sin where we have been slothful and lazy and have bought into the Americanized idea of skating, of getting by, by doing the least we can do. And we know today that it is of the devil. 
and help us to repent of it ourselves where we have sinned in that area and uh, help us to pray hard think hard and work hard and uh, play hard as well for the short time that we do that in jesus christ's name we pray and for his sake amen now beloved in closing if you do not know jesus christ as your personal savior in the free pardon of your sins in the gospel of john jesus christ said for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son jesus christ he was talking about himself that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life the bible also says in romans 10 9 and 13 that if thou you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead that thou you shall be saved for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved dear friend if you believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for your sins was buried and rose from the dead and you want to trust him today for your salvation. Please believe that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. And pray and ask him to save your soul, and he will save you. For the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou you shall be saved for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved let's pray repeat after me phrase by phrase and mean it from your heart Holy Father God I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I have broken your Ten Commandments. I have lied before, I have lusted before, have the other people and other things. I have dishonored my parents, I have uh, uh, committed adultery. and other sins for Jesus Christ's sake please forgive me of all of my sins as I now believe with all of my heart in the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for me was buried and rose again Lord Jesus please come into my heart and save my soul And change my life fill me with your Holy Spirit and uh, help me to repent of my sins past and to turn from my old life and to follow you in the new life in Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake amen Now, dear friend of mine, if you just trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you prayed that prayer with me and you meant it from your heart, I declare to you that based upon the Word of God uh, in the Bible, you are now saved from hell and you are on your way to heaven. Welcome to the family of God. I want to congratulate you on doing the most important thing in life, and that is receiving, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, go to gospelightsociety.com and read what to do after you enter through the door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door by me of any man empty in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Until next time, my beloved, may the Lord bless you and keep you 
is my prayer.